thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth, and um, thanks to Nader and uh, Lorena and others who have invited me here and made this uh, possible. It's a great honor to be back here. Uh, it's, I think, 20 plus years since I last formally presented anything uh, within this building, and so um, I hope you enjoy this lecture. So I would like to dedicate my lecture to Raymond Abraham and Diane Luce, two of my um, really favorite professors, both of whom I worked with uh, over the summers, um, and, and also to this institution, which is in and of itself a counter institution. Um, it has had like a long and rich history of how this idea has played out. Um, I'm not here to discuss that at the moment, although it is a great topic that someone should undertake. Uh, I would like to just say that part of the way in which my own practice has developed, and it's taken a while really going through um, different types of architectural environments, uh, working on museums with uh, Herzog and Demeron, to finally formulating my own idea of what I would want to do and my interest in history uh, and my interest of late in the documentation of community histories and seeing how that could be a resource for, for us to reshape and rethink the city. So uh, this is some of what I would like to share. Um, through the scholarship, I explore the cultural and material dimensions of self-organized spaces and as an architect, I'm interested in finding ways in which to leverage both formal and informal structures um, to kind of create a practice that's more wholesome rather than uh, a kind of top-down working with city or development as it occurs within the city. So this is sort of a kind of a goal where both my scholarship as well as uh, my practice is now veering towards. So um, I want to start with this image uh, that shows it's like an old, given that there's so much uh, more that we see of activism within the city and within cities across the globe, you know, a, a younger generation, much to the delight of an old left guard, are finally taking to the streets and demanding justice and equity. Uh, the space of appearance, this is a phrase coined by the philosopher Hannah Arendt, describes the importance of a visible public sphere. Um, this position holds open space in high regard and prioritizes parks, squares, <coughs> streets where demonstrations are staged. Marches up and down uh, Broadway have targeted different buildings um, as well as ended at important sites such as the UN. So architecture within this kind of landscape of uh, activism really acts as a sort of symbolic uh, device against which sometimes the anger of the street and the mob is, uh, is targeted. And so while I agree that outdoor sp space is crucial to democracy, I'm interested in highlighting some other types of spaces within the city that are equally important to political action. One such place in New York City, uh, an architectural eyesore and an unlikely candidate for urban glory was this three-story office building situated very close to here at the corner of Lafayette and Bleecker Streets in Lower Manhattan. It's um, unfortunately a kit store now. I haven't been inside, but um, this is something that probably is what you're more familiar with. Um, but this just happened a year or two ago. So in imagining a place capable of nurturing radicals, one seldom thinks of an office building with desks, computers, phones, filing cabinets, and general clutter. However, such well-worn, personalized spaces have nonetheless served as a forum for political mobilization for generations. In 1969, um, right in the midst of the Vietnam War, the War Resisters League, which is the oldest secular, pacifist, anti-war organization, bought this building 
for a small sum of money and repurposed it into offices for the anti-war associates, affectionately nicknamed the Peace Pentagon. This decrepit property became the unofficial headquarters of the peace and justice movement in New York City. Uh, Forty years later, in 2009, uh, when I was first acquainted with this building myself, uh, an impending MTA project work on the subway station underneath the building led to the revelation of a structural problem, one that would require a substantial sum of money to remediate. A property rich but cash poor, this is a phrase that I've heard a lot uh, in New York City, the owners of the building considered sale and relocation for rental office space. It was at this juncture that a group of us uh, activists, users, architects got together and tried to find ways to save this building. So in order to uh, conserve the legacy of activism on this site while acknowledging the fragility of the physical structure, we launched an architectural competition, Peace Pentagon and a Call to Action. The competition brief asked participants to envision a new design for this building that would accommodate the current and future tenants, optimize resources, and raise awareness about the mission of its users. So we received over 100 entries um, for this competition, and many of the participants interestingly chose to keep this building, purposing the kind of the structurally unsound half um, as a kind of place to reorganize the offices and keeping the old shell of the building as a memory. Uh, so in order, order to publicize the project and bring attention to the building, we curated an exhibition and installed the entries that we received uh, in several public locations in close proximity to the building. This included a branch library, a bookstore, and a collectively run art gallery. All these spaces, too, were sort of in a similar kind of situation in, in a way in which uh, they were threatened for, for dislocation. So in negotiating the venues for this exhibition within the neighborhood, I began cataloging an inventory of similar sympathetic sites in the larger area of the Lower East Side and found that a network of self-organized spaces provides a hidden infrastructure of social support that is vital to effect ground up change within the city. So, in my book, which I have here, if you do you want to pass it around? Mm -hmm. Let's look at it. Thanks. So, in my book, Counter Institution Activist Estates of the Lower East Side, uh, this book grew out of this project to map out the eff efforts of generations of progressive, radical, and artistic dissidents and their paradoxical relationship to real estate. The counter institution in the title refers to a conceptual and a literal struggle to create a space for civic action that is built upon real estate speculation. Um, in the book, I discuss three examples of space-based activist organizing in the Lower East Side. Uh, there's three case studies that represent different but overlapping political constituencies that emerged in New York in the 1970s. So I just want to say that um, although I provide a little history pre-1970s, it's the 70s that I'm interested in when there is this sudden disinvestment, uh, landlords are abandoning their properties, and different kinds of groups are taking over these, um, these estates. The first of these uh, was the Peace Pentagon that I already introduced to you. The second was the El Bojillo Community Center, set up to celebrate the cultural and environmental activism of the Puerto Rican community. And the third is ABC No Rio that was created in 1979 as a storefront gallery by members of an artist collective to pursue, quote, non-commercial, community-oriented, experimental art practices. So these are the three different buildings that um, I discuss within the book. and. Um, Today I'm just going to focus on the El Bojillo building because that's the building that also ties in 
most uh, directly to the exhibit that Elizabeth mentioned earlier. So radical movements have historically formed a bulwark against reoccurring cycles of real estate speculation. An economic downturn in the 1970s led to the large-scale abandonment, disinvestment, and demolition that turned once vibrant neighborhoods into veritable ghost towns. So this was not just the case with New York. It, was, um, it happened in Chicago. It was happening all over this country um, and also across the globe, actually. So the worsening conditions within the neighborhoods, such as the South Bronx, Harlem, and the Lower East Side disproportionately impacted the poor minority populations, in this case the Puerto Ricans that had migrated to the city in the previous decade. The multiple crises of employment, housing, and education unfolding in these neighborhoods transformed many residents into activists and generated new forms of political agency, particularly among the younger generation. So uh, I just want to say that a lot of I'm, I'm really interested in this exploration of this, the Puerto Rican identity as well as the kinds of activism that came out of this movement because it was really induced by this kind of crisis that was occurring within the urban environment. One such group to emerge from this dire situation was a Puerto Rican youth collective called CHARAS, C-H-A-R-A-S. Uh, CHARAS is an acronym made up of the names of its founding members. In 1968, they met the architect provocateur Buckminster Fuller at a lecture um, on Tompkins Square Park and were inspired by his talk to join a global movement to eliminate poverty and build a sustainable future. They enlisted Fuller's enthusiastic support, applied for some grants, and then began the work of building prototypes for a prefab geodesic dome house in the Lower East Side. So uh, this is just part of my project is to sort of, people often disassociate histories and put them into little buckets and I just want to show how rich and fertile <coughs> this kind of exchange is between um, alleged gang, transformed gang members from the, the kind of housing projects, they grew up there and then they meet Buckminster Fuller and they're the best of friends. So Charis members leased a third floor of a condemned city-owned warehouse along the waterfront and skillfully converted it into a workshop and living quarters. The expansive live-work quarters were gradually filled with models, tools, drawings, and mock-ups. This active design build studio generated interest among many of the children living nearby and the teenagers recruited by Charis for this project quickly became part of this growing collective. <coughs> by the winter of 1972, Charis members had built two prototype domes with bent cardboard triangles, reinforced, reinforced metal mesh, and plastered ferro-cement in a city-owned vacant lot. This test dome enjoyed a brief sojourn close to the piers of the Manhattan Bridge before being dismantled by the city to make way for a housing development. Although the prefab dome house proved untenable in New York City, Charles's dome building activities and the group's outreach to the neighborhood youth continued to expand over the next four decades. Within the Lower East Side, deteriorating buildings and public spaces became staging grounds for experiments in alternative technology, building, as well as cultural practices. In 1974, when the Puerto Rican poet Bimbo Rivas, who is also um, a plumber, memorialized this blighted territory in his poem, Loisaida, he took a significant step in claiming the neighborhood as a spiritual as well as a physical home for the struggling Puerto Rican community. The name Loisaida, which is a kind of pronunciation of the Lower East Side uh, in, in, by Spanish-speaking Puerto Ricans, helped galvanize support for a series of actions involving the idea of a place that was variously 
reimagined as a movement, an ideology, and a state of mind. These sentiments were transmitted by word of mouth, poetry, and performance, um, such as this one here by a theater group on East 4th Street uh, at Avenue C. So on a more pragmatic front, residents organized to take over abandoned and vacant city-owned buildings. This is a, a map here of the couple of blocks surrounding Tompkins Square Park from 14th Street to Houston, from Avenue D to Avenue A. And it shows in green the amount of uh, properties that were abandoned at this time. Some of these buildings were torn down. And a lot of the gardens that we see today in the Lower East Side uh, were really on these burned down lots uh, that, that remain vacant for a considerable period of time. So um, what Charles was involved in was uh, a process called urban homesteading, which was recognized as a legitimate way to rehab housing in several cities across the country facing a similar housing crisis. In the late 70s, this movement expanded to explore the use of renewable energy as a means to achieve greater self-sufficiency. Recycling, gardening, and seeking alternatives to energy, the prioritization of a holistic social alternative to economy, culture, and housing was the true goal of what came to be known as the alternative technology movement in Loisida. A multi-generational and monthly <coughs> effort, the homesteads and gardens in Loisida represent an example of how bottom-up organizing could be the way to create what um, social theorist Murray Bookchin advocated as a liberal municipal society. And Bookchin, who is um, in some sense connected to the whole Bernie Sanders uh, Vermont network, was also very intimately involved with this kind of movement that was occurring in the Lower East Side. So uh, this drawing here shows a collection of community control properties that became a part of this process and were emblematic of the ethos of collective commoning in the city. So when we speak of commoning practices, um, it's often presented as a very uh, utopian, unattainable idea, but here there is an actual physical outcome that happened through this moment in time. Um, there's still a lot of partially affordable, partially decommodified housing that is um, a direct outcome from this moment in time. So in the late 80s, as capital began to flow back into the city, the once abandoned and neglected sites that had been transformed into a productive urban landscape were increasingly coveted by those with speculative interests. Whereas the 70s, in the 70s, community groups had focused on laying a physical claim to an unwanted neighborhood, the next decade was, was spent preserving these gains and warding off new threats of dislocation in a rapidly gentrifying city. Um, this is a story we are familiar with, and it begins fairly early on. So urban historians and scholars view the flow of educated white artists, galleries, clubs, and cultural institutions into formerly poor and working class neighborhoods as a contributing factor, if not a direct cause of gentrification. In the case of Loisida, the influx of artists, anarchists, and radicals were seen by some locals as a potential ally in the struggle against the city developer coalition. In 1975, Charas sponsored a large scale mural in the community garden uh, known as La Plaza Cultural. It still exists on um, 9th Street at the intersection of Avenue C. And some of these murals are still there if you want to um, take a walk down there and take a look at them. But dispossession, revolution, and the community were united in these array of global political murals. Black edged bands with white letters reading La Lucha Continua, the struggle continues visually tied separate images executed by many different artists into a fluid continuum. Uh, 
Um, so this is a bit of a leap from sort of the history to uh, another type of project that I'm engaged in at present. Uh, and then this is still really, again, about the struggle, the struggle against gentrification for community control spaces. Uh, this is the alarming orange in the South Bronx, so well connected to Manhattan, is, uh, and this is from 19, no, 2016. It says, it suggests that the South Bronx is the most buzzed about and cheapest borough for development. So this type of frontier mentality, so embedded in our real estate psyche, overlooks history as well as the present and continues to view territory as a tabula rasa to be developed for maximum profit. What are the alternatives, one might ask? This graphic by the New York Community Land Trust Initiative advocates for the community land trust as a model for community controlled neighborhood development in order to keep existing city-owned property affordable in perpetuity, shielded from the vagaries of the private market. Uh, within the South Bronx, a coalition of residents and organizations have united to form the Mott Haven Port Morris Community Land Trust. Uh, as their pilot project for their community land trust, they have set their sights on this vacant Lincoln Detox Center. It's a uh, old, um, again, from the 1930s. It's, it was a, a, a sort of a health and hospitals building. Uh, it's in the heart of Mott Haven. It was abandoned in 2013 by the city. Not abandoned, but it was vacated by the city in 2013, and it's laid vacant ever since. So uh, the Mott Haven Community Land Trust wants to adapt this three-story health department building into a central hub that will provide much needed workrooms, <coughs> shared meeting spaces, event and performance spaces. In their bid to reclaim this facility as a place for local organizations and to envision future possibilities, the Mott Haven CLT has, this, has in initiated a research with uh, me and my students at City College. So this is a kind of overlap between the research, uh, the teaching, um, as well as my own practice. Within the studio format, the students combine methods of traditional architectural research with experimental envisioning workshops to engage residents and organizers in planning the future community center. Uh, this image here represents um, some of the different organizers we interacted with over the course of the semester. Uh, here's a workshop that we conducted in Brook Park, which is another community garden. You know, they have chickens and honey making, and they grow things in the summer with um, school children involved in these programs. And so we we worked on this project with some of the community people um, on park benches uh, with these models that the students had devised to sort of create an interactive uh, storytelling and a wish list of what needed to happen with what became then known as the Hearts Community Center, Hearts being Health, Education, and the Arts. So in the fall of 2017, the Mott Haven Community Land Trust put together a team of consultants and they're further investigating, adapting this building into this community facility. Um, after much paperwork and phone calls to the city, we were allowed to access the building in 2018. Uh, the years of vacancy and neglect have eroded the interior, but we determined that Actually, the bones of the building are good. It's in a fairly robust condition and can still easily be um, uh, adapted into this desired community center. So here we show some of the site analysis we did. It, the block itself is a very special block. It's surrounded by public amenities, such as public housing, schools, playgrounds, and the Hearts Community Center hopes to capitalize on this infrastructure connecting to the outside and creating a sort of porosity between the front and the back of the building as well as the sides. It's three sides base, uh, what are fairly 
public uh, amenities within the block. So based on this report that we've been working on, we did a breakdown of existing spaces to figure out how the center might work. So, you know, typically as an architect, your work starts when someone gives you the program and um, you begin to design a building. But over here, um, and beginning with my students, the task has been to really work with the community to sort of come up with the program and also look into the future because a lot of the buildings that I've been studying within um, my book uh, seem to come to this impasse when it comes to the point of maintaining the building. So it's one thing to acquire a building, but another thing to actually be able to continue to support activity within that building. So these are just some of the drawings we did looking at the possibility of adding some housing to the building and the community after a lot of conversation rejected this idea. Um, they wanted it to be a real community center, one that was dedicated to this rich programming that they already have. Um, they have a lot of groups working with kids on music and the arts and culture and this is what they wanted the center to be about. Um, this is a kind of <coughs> series of images that shows how the project, project was finally presented at this community festival. The festival is occurring outside the building. Um, you can see the kind of community, the Latinx community, the, the kids that are part of this performance programming. Um, these are the future users of this building um, and we presented our models and our drawings and everyone was very interested. It was a, a really fun way to actually be able to see your clients um, as this sort of diverse body of people that all needed to be told and uh, taken into account in this planning process. So working closely with organizers and documenting community histories has made me aware of the importance of access and engagement. You know, often people um, do not know what architects do. And, you know, I think our first job is to really tell them what we would like to do with them. And so this summer, as a kind of first provocation in collaboration with the Loisida Center, um, I introduced these four carts at the Loisida uh, Summer Festival. The intention of the carts uh, was to map memories, to collect ideas, to get comments from the community as to what they thought about this neighborhood um, in its present status. These are some of the, the, the pinnings that were made onto the, the maps that were on the cards and we're still kind of collating all this information and we're going to make it available back online. Um, as the show moves forward. So here's a poster for the exhibition um, that Elizabeth introduced earlier. The exhibit is titled Activist Estates, a history of, uh, a, a radical history of real estate in Loisida, and it's curated and designed by me. It's an expansion of some of the themes of the book, and it opened this month. The project is based on a desire to enlarge the intricate time and space-based histories of activism, some of the drawings and images that um, I have in the book and some of the archival research that I did as well as some of the oral histories that went into the making of the book. I had, you know, I wanted to present it in a more accessible fashion. Um, let's face it, how many people read from cover to cover. So it was an idea to like take this to the next level of, of trying to engage with an audience. So uh, I'll just show some photographs. This just opened last week, so it, it, I'm still sort of thinking about what it means, uh, who's going to interact with it, how one gets a larger and wider audience into these rooms along with um, Libertad Guerra, the director of the Loisida Center, who is also really interested in documenting 
uh, what she sees at, as uh, these invisible histories of occupation within the different neighborhoods of, of uh, New York. So the the first of the first the exhibition begins literally in the lobby, and I call this view from above. The activist estates uh, are about a network of properties that exist in the Lower East Side. These different counter institutions are mapped and network um, in this very kind of large format map. And the view from above presents the neighborhood as this historic bastion of immigration, diversity, and creative resistance. Um, within the corridors, we've set up this timeline, but it's also called View from the Street. And it's a document of the visible street actions and the pageantry of occupations. Um, a lot of different artists uh, are involved in the creation of all the propaganda work that goes into these um, efforts. And so the different types of activism here, pacifist, environmental, and anarchic, are coded in the blue, green, and yellow. Within this timeline, drawings produced within the book are enlarged and cut up and placed and interleaved within the official policies. And these are all juxtaposed on the insurgent actions of rallies, protests, and civil disobedience. Um, the timeline, I think, is very successful um, in the way in which it breaks down to the scale of the human body. Um, and people take a real interest, actually. You can almost tell where they're coming from by the amount of time they spend in one section of the timeline. So it's very much. Uh, and then they come back to me with, like, this is not how it was. So that it is very, it's a very engaging exhibit. It's not something I did put out there, and then I don't hear back from anyone. People have a lot of opinions. These people are still very much alive and living in the neighborhood, and they have um, a definite point of view that gets relayed back to me within this, this structure. And finally, the the corridor leads to this larger, opens up into this larger room, which is typically where they have their exhibits. This is their gallery space. Um, and within this, I created this idea of the more intimate spaces that I refer to in the book. The view from within refers to the interior where generations of activists have collaborated and argued to shape popular resistance whether broadcasting against government misinformation, stuffing envelopes, or planning marches, hosting performances, showing films, the activities that play, take place within the walls of the activist estates relies on an ethic of solidarity and DYI volunteerism. Oh, good morning. <laughs> So um, in the book and in the exhibit, I really celebrate this sort of domestic anarchy of the interior that is simultaneously personalized and cultivated by the activists. Um, these are spaces where the creativity of movement resistance is nurtured. Um, and then just lastly, I just want to say a little bit about these carts that are also now uh, pre present within this room. Uh, where we wanted to bring a kind of current movement focus. Each of the carts, was, uh, which was deployed in the previous festival, are here refurbished with these perforated metal panels and display screens. Um, and they are each taken over by a different organizer that then adds more information onto them about their ongoing campaigns for housing and social justice. Um, and my contribution to the carts are these models, such as this one, which is on 4th Street, not far from here, which is the only really functional community land trust that has about 20, used, 20 tenement buildings under their control, uh, which provides for affordable housing in this neighborhood. So if you lived in one of these, you would be paying. $200 in rent as opposed to whatever you pay at the moment. And so the community land trust is, again, highlighted. You know, these stories are all intertwined. Um, and this is a map that kind of shows that the Cooper Square, it's called the Cooper Square MHA 
uh, Mutual Housing Association. Um, and I will just end right here on this little postcard from the show that shows the cards um, and the way in which I am trying to represent uh, both the history as well as the ongoing need for activism and within the Lower East Side, but also within the city of New York. And I will end there and we can have more questions.